Welcome to the Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners podcast. You will hear about industry insights with award-winning financial planner and entrepreneur, Jason Pereira. Through the interviews with different experts with their stories and advice, you will learn how you can navigate the challenges of being an entrepreneur, plan for success, and make the most of your business and life. And now, your host, Jason Pereira. Hello, and thanks for joining. Today on the podcast, I have Doug Grunchy, owner and operator of DR Pension Consulting. I brought him on the show because Doug is probably the foremost authority when it comes to understanding Canada Pension Plan and what it is and the implications and decisions that go around that. Simple enough topic, most people think, but there's actually a fair amount of complexity to the program and a lot of myths to dispel. So I brought him in to take care of all of that. And with that, here's my interview with Doug. Doug, thank you for taking the time today. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. So, Doug Runchy, tell us a little bit about what it is you do. Well, I, I work, first of all, I, I worked with Service Canada in its various forms and worked with the Canada Pension for about 30 years uh, in my first life, first job, uh, at least anyway. So I got to know it very well. Uh, and then I, I took, I retired from the government at an early age, uh, started my second career working actually at the Home Depot and got talking with a lot of the staff there and realized how nobody understood the Canada Pension Plan, knew much about it other than they paid in some money and maybe they'd get something back at the end, but they had very little uh, detail on anything about it. So I started providing the information free to all my co-workers and then thought, hey, there's a there's a market for this information. So I started my third career about 10 years ago, consulting on Canada pension and old age security, but primarily Canada pension. And the industry is all the better for it. And I will say that I have lived that firsthand and seen it many times. I still remember very early on in my career, maybe first or second year, going to see a family whose uh, blue collar father would just retire, stayed at home, mother was there and daughter was there to go through all their options and went through with CPP and OS were going to pay them. And they're like, this is ridiculous. You know, you work all your life for this. You contribute to this and this is all you get. You know, who, you know, how, this isn't enough for these people to live off of. And my response was, it's not meant to be the thing that basically gets to you more than the fundamentals, quite honestly. And it's one of those things where that's a, there's a gentleman who basically took a blind eye to the entire thing, just yeah. as soon as making pension contributions and he was going to get, you know, his retirement is going to be taken care of. And, and for so many people, the concept of pension age is retirement age. And I always say, you know, pensions and retirements are two separate things. One is something that's going to pay you an income for life. The other one is your ability to actually live off whatever, whatever means you have. And people just have a hard time with that. So uh, let me get off my soapbox. Let's talk about basically see Canada pension plan. So talk to me about how Canada Pension Plan works. And let's start off in particular with how benefits accrue, who, how do you pay for it? And then we'll get into the benefits portion of it afterward. Yeah. Okay. So you pay for it if you have earnings from employment or self-employment. Those are the only two incomes that you can make CPP contributions on. And rough rates, it's it's uh, right now, it's almost 6% for an employee and uh, 6% for the employer or you're lucky enough to be self-employed, you get to pay both parts of that. So it's almost 12%. Uh, next year is is when it's going to reach that level and it's 5.95. So 11.9% total, call it 12 when you're paying both uh, shares of it. So those contributions go in, they, they build up a fund, uh, the fund gets... Uh, invested and and uh, creates a lot of uh, the uh, ability to pay benefits in that way. Sorry, was it just the, the funding that you were asking? Yeah, let's talk about the funding. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the contributions are the only incoming uh, money to the fund, uh, except for the reinvestment of those contributions. And that's all managed by us. It used to be at one point in time, the money was all loaned to the provinces at bond interest rates, and it wasn't making a lot of money. And, and there uh, we're probably going back 30 years or 40 years now when there was a lot of talk about the the fund being insufficient to, to pay benefits. 
and whoops, it's not going to be there. At that point in time, the contribution rate was 1.8% when the CPP first began for each of the employee and the employer. And uh, there wasn't enough going to be enough money. And But the contribution rate increased from there to where it is now, as I say, and it's going up a little bit more next year. And uh, the projections are that there's lots of money in the fund now to pay benefits benefits for the next, the fund is financially sound for the next 75 years, if you believe the actuaries. And and I hear very little about the fund going broke any, any longer. So I, well, you're, 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 I hear it a lot. Uh, yeah. Still, so yeah. It's still a myth that exists. So right. the, it's, it's funny because I think that there's a big hangover of advisors of a certain age who grew up here, who came into the business hearing about how Canada pension plan was, was insolvent. And at the time, critically, it was. And, you know, since then that fund's been, been grown and, you know, the CPP uh, investment board came into existence and has basically been managing this on our behalf and doing, you know, depending on who you, who, a debatably yeah. good job. All right. We can leave as an argument there, but they're at $523 billion right now and continue to grow every year. So, so we're not, yeah. we're not at the stage where the fund is a hundred percent still funding. I understand, but you know, yeah. enough at the point where, you know, this is not like a situation in the U S where social security is paid for by way of, of tax receipt. Right. So it's a, pay as a go system. We actually have a true pension, which is, Hey, there's money being banked for your future. Part of your money goes into that. And that's where it goes. So let's, let's go back to the contribution rates. Now, a couple of years ago, there was an overhaul of the CPP and they changed the benefit amounts, which we'll get to shortly and the contribution rates. So where are the contribution rates today and where are they scheduled to go? Yeah. Well, as I said, they started out at 1.8%. They went up with the concern about the security of the fund. They went up to 4.95%. And and that was about 20 years ago. And they stayed there until 2019. And, And that's probably what you're referring to, the enhanced CPP, where the benefits were going to go up from the 25% earnings replacement formula to a 33.33% earnings replacement formula. And that's what has resulted in the most recent increase. It's basically been staged over five years uh, from 2019 through 2023, an increase of 1% for each of the employer and employer up from the 4.95% to 5.95%. And that's as high as anybody sees it going at, at this point in time for the level of benefits that's currently planned. And then there's one small further change that starts happening in 2024 and 2025, where you only contribute right now on earnings up to what's called the YMPE or year's maximum pensionable earnings. And that's currently 63,900. Starting in 2024, that there's going to be a new ceiling above that called the YAMPE, year's additional maximum pensionable earnings. That'll be 7% above the YMPE in 2024 and 14% above it in 2025 and beyond. And the contribution rate between the YMP and the new upper uh, earnings ceiling is anticipated to be four percent for each of the employer and employer. So I mean, yeah, it's like there's been a, this these changes have created a bit of complexity. We're gonna get to the to the benefit in a minute here, but I mean, as yeah. on, on the contribution side, they kind of put a bow on this. There is to be clear, there's a personal amount which we haven't talked about, personal exemption, which you does not qualify for C, for Canada pension plan, which is thirty five hundred dollars. So yeah. no Canada pension plans paid in the first thirty five hundred dollars, and then it goes up to the YMP, which we talked about, which this year is sixty four thousand nine hundred and. And then there's going to be, and that's going to continue to, that increases every year. And there's going to be the additional, you know, YA, uh, YM, YAPMP, used to yeah. this, whatever this new acronym is that goes beyond that. And, yeah. you know, we've gone from 4.9% of the, the amount between the YMPP and the basic to now 5.7, eventually to 5.95 in those yeah. numbers. And then anything beyond that number up to another cap is going to be four. So it's gotten a lot more complicated, but bottom line is, is that for the average employee, it is not going to be more than 5.95% of their earnings going into this. Okay. So the, well, let's talk about the benefits side. Okay. And actually let's, one last thing. So that's a, to be clear, that's a cap. 2022, it's a cap of 34 
9980 for per employee per year. And we'll talk about self-employed people later. But now let's talk about the benefits side. So you had mentioned percentages. Okay. So let's talk about this. Canada pension plan was always always basically designed to cover a percentage of a certain amount of earnings. Can you speak to that entire calculation? Yeah. So the percentage up till recently was 25% of your average lifetime earnings. So it's sort of a five-step process. And when you become eligible for a benefit, all of your earnings for every year back to age 18 get escalated to a current year of value. And then there's a few different dropout provisions that get applied so that you're not, everybody's allowed what they call the 17% general dropout. So you get to drop out between seven and eight years of your lowest earnings. So whether it was at the beginning when you turned 18 and you're still going to school and maybe working part-time or whether you start right out of high school working and you stop working at age 55 and you have some low earnings or zero earnings years there before you start receiving your pension. Whatever the reason for your period of low earnings, you get to drop out, as I say, 17% of that time so that it doesn't affect your average. But then the rest of the time, your earnings after they're escalated to a current year value get added together, divided by your whole contributory period, and the amount of your pension is 25% of that average lifetime earnings worked out to a monthly uh, amount. And that's prior to 2019, when, as I say, at, from that point on, it's uh, intended to replace 33.3%. So going from a quarter of your lifetime average earnings up to a third, and that's what it will replace in terms of a retirement pension. But again, with the enhanced, there's a 40-year transition period before anyone will receive a third of their lifetime earnings because you have to pay in it, into it for 40 years starting from 2019. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot to unpack there, you said. So, going back over it, at the end of the day, you know, we're talking about a small percentage, a quarter of what was, you know, effectively for years, let's call it close to $50,000. So, we're talking, yeah. we're talking about, this is where I said before, you know, we're not talking about a huge ton of money here. We're talking about twelve fifty dollars a month. That's yeah. why $12,500 a year was roughly, and I mean, that number's increased and continues to increase. But the point here is, is that when I talk about the need to prepare for retirement, you know, CPP and OAS are there really, and we'll talk about OAS in a future episode, are there to provide for basic lifestyle need, you know, food and shelter, that's it. So you might have to be on that, it's on you. But now we're saying, the, now now they're saying, A, it's going to increase to 33. And like, you're right, like it doesn't retroactively increase to 33, it's mm-hmm. for future contributions going forward. So it's like, whereas previously I was earning a 25% credit, now I'm earning a 33% credit. So yeah, it'll creep up, but it'll be my, you know, my kid will be the guy that will be the one who starts off and <laughs> yeah. or, or people, children are starting off earning the full credit. And then there's yes. the, the second point on dropout years, which is an important one, right? In that, yeah, if I'm working from 18 to 22, like 23 in school, barely earning any money, and that is counting against my average, that's not great, right? Or, or you know, the years off for child rearing or, you know, more commonly now taking care of senior, uh, you know, your, your parents as they right. get older through retirement. And that's pretty unique. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever seen a dropout ratio thrown into any other pension calculation. Like the, the ability that the, the government's saying, look, you know, here's kind of a bunch of years to accommodate for life issues. It's, it's a pretty good benefit, quite honestly. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, I had mentioned only the general dropout, and that applies to everybody. You mentioned the child rearing dropout, and that's, uh, a, yes, that's two different ones. Yeah. That's a specific uh, dropout that applies to anyone that's raising a child under age seven and stops working or works part time <laughs> for those years. They get to drop out those child rearing years in addition to the general dropout. So overall, in summary, the formula for the benefit is year. So basically years you've been a member of the plan or basically years you've been working yeah. times the 25% of the you know, difference between YMP and the dropout amount. So whatever that, that equation is times the number of the average earnings and the average earnings is modified based off of your dropout years. So Hey, they're not going to penalize you for these low years because you were either in school or something happened, but there's enough data there that over 40 year, 40, 50 years, we can make an assumption. So that's how it goes. Okay. So then that's the benefit formula. 
That's so, the benefit but, if, if you, or that's the formula. If you take your CPP right at age 65, and uh, then yes. you can take it earlier than age 65, and there's a reduction to that amount, or you can delay after age 65 and the benefit amount goes up. So you beat me to it. The next question was, let's talk about, okay, so that is, that is 65 is normal CPP retirement age in the U.S. Yeah. They have an equivalent called uh, full, ret- uh, full retirement age. But again, like you said, in Canada, we provide optionality. You are able to take it later. You're able to take it sooner. So it used to, and I remember when I got in the industry, a lot of the, 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 the advice was around take it as soon as possible. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's flips. So let's talk about the calculation first. And let's talk about the trade-off, the benefit of the loss and benefit. And then we'll talk about what it makes sense for you to once. So by all means, please take us through this. Okay. So if you want to take your CPP earlier than age 65, there's a couple of things happening. First of all, your calculated CPP, meaning your 25% of your lifetime earnings is Uh, calculated at the time you take your benefit. So say you take it at the earliest opportunity at age 60 and you're not working any longer, that makes your average earnings at age 60 is going to be higher than if you wait till age 65 and add five more years and unless you're able to drop those years out. So you may get a higher average lifetime earnings by doing the calculation at age 60, but then you you only get to claim six, you lose 0.6% per month for every year you take it early. So that works out to 7.2% per year or 36% if you take it at the earliest opportunity at age 60. So instead of getting 100% of your, of 25% of your average lifetime earnings, you get 64% of your calculated CPP at age 60, but you get it for five years longer. So again, if you live to a normal life expectancy, you'll probably receive about the same total dollar payout if you take it at age 60 or if you wait until age 65. On the other end of the scale, if you wait beyond age 65, the benefit amount is increased by 0.7%. For every month that you defer, so 8.4% for every year you defer, up to a maximum increase of 42% if you defer right up till age 70. So to be clear on that, 36% less at age 60 than you receive at 65, 42% more. Now, a couple of things to touch upon those numbers, because I know you know that there's some witchcraft to this. As you said earlier, you could actually, if you're going to stop working and you're going to have dropout years that you're beyond dropout years, you can actually end up with a better calculation of your average income at 60 and 65 than than, uh, than 65. But at age 70, that number can actually be substantially bigger than just 42 because now we're talking about different YMPs, right? We're talking about the, the, yeah. those, that threshold is increasing. So talk, uh, so, so talk to me about that and how that impacts the payout at 70. Yeah, well, I, I mentioned uh, earlier that the first step in the process of the calculation is to bring all of your lifetime earnings up to a current year value. And the way that occurs is whatever year your benefit starts, you take the average YMPE for the five years ending with the year that your benefit starts. So if you defer from 2022 to 2027, you defer five years, the earnings get escalated up to a 2027 value instead of a 2022 value. So you're getting 42% more, but of a as you said, depending on what the YMPE does between now and 27, you'll get that increase as well. And that will be a trade-off. If you had started your benefit in 2022, your benefit is indexed for life according to price increases as measured by the consumer price index. So you'll go up that way if you defer your benefit for a period of time. It doesn't get escalated with price increases. It gets escalated with wage increases as measured by the YMPE. So again, sometimes those two things go up together and sometimes one or the other 
goes up at a slightly faster rate. So you should look at the numbers and what's happening with wages and prices as part of the decision of when to start your CPP. Yeah, and this gets this is where it gets complicated, right? Because I mean, I've seen calculations where I mean, pre-inflation ticking off. Okay, I was seeing numbers of of studies done where it was fifty percent more, not forty two. And mm-hmm. when you start doing the math on, and a lot of times the math on, do I take it early or do I take it late, is solely based on the trade off of well, what's the break even year? Like, when am I? If I take it now, how many years did it collect for? And you know, I would say that 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 logic is is pretty flawed. It's pretty flawed because. Look, you know what? If you're someone who's got a medical issue that is pretty severe, then sure. it, and it's a logical mm-hmm. medical issue. But if you're not like that, the reality is, is that like the reality is, is that a, in, an inf- a, a pension that is 50 percent higher if you wait five years, if you wait five years, that is government backed and guaranteed for life. And we have yet to talk on this inflation index, which right now that is something that everybody's concerned with, right? Yeah. That is something that you cannot replace. So the break-even analysis, you know, the the inflation increases on a 50% greater pension than at that 65, or dare I say it, almost double what you would get at 60. Those inflation yeah. index increases are much more valuable than the, you know if you defer. Yeah, I won't I won't argue with any of those uh points and and you you, you can take different periods in time when that might not have been quite true, but those are, are the, yeah. the current facts. But it's, but it's interesting you go there, and I'm going to say that you're absolutely right, but I also think that that's important to reflect the fact that pensions in themselves are just not about retirement income. They're about risk mitigation. And I think we don't we lose track of that too often in that I always see things like, well, I can make a greater rate of return than my pension did. Well, you can't compare a variable return with no guaranteed floor of income to a pension. One is an absolute zero in risk as far as it goes, like short of Canada imploding as a nation. Our, this is the most solid ROI you can get. Uh, yeah. You know for sure you're going to get something for life. And you've eliminated all mortality risks, which there's very few products on the market that do that. Versus yeah. you know, investing in yourself, even if you're doing something very conservative, it's not going from zero to one. It's going from zero to 100 in terms of a risk scale differential, right? Yeah. And that's that's the challenge. And people yeah. have a hard time writing, wrapping their head around that. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, so that's my soapbox on that. So let's talk about what happens if you continue to work post 65, 65, because there's something important that happens there. There's a couple of things, and it depends on whether you take your CPP or don't take your CPP. If you don't take your CPP and you keep working beyond age 65, you can use each year of earnings to replace one of your earlier years of lower earnings. So again, assuming you didn't have you didn't have 39 years of maximum earnings already, but you've got a good job now and you're 65. If you work five more years until 70, you can take those five years of maximum earnings, replace five years of zero or low earnings, and increase your average lifetime earnings significantly, and then get 42% more than that increase. Plus, as you said, whatever the YMPE has gone up. So increase it significantly. If you take your CPP at age 65 or earlier and you're still working, you get a choice of whether you don't make any CPP contributions and you just save that money yourself, or you can make contributions and you will earn a what's called a post-retirement benefit or a PRB for each year that you work after you start receiving your CPP, whether that's at 65 or even as early as 60. If you took your CPP right at 60 and you're still working for the first five years until age 65, it's mandatory that you continue to make contributions and earn a PRB. I want to hit that note very hard here because this is a huge misconception in the advisor community. We are all trained that basically you can opt out of paying for CPP after 65. But what is typically left away from that literature is the fact that you have to start it. And most yeah. advisors don't realize that. And they think it's just, oh, I can stop paying at this point. No, no, no. You have to start CPP, which if you're starting at 65, now you're giving up the deferral benefit. Yes, you are gaining this post-retirement benefit for contributions beyond that if you choose to keep on, um, uh, on doing it. But it's so it's not a binary decision of mm. do I do I take it or keep contributing? You can do both, but you can't stop contributing unless you're taking it, which is which will often kerfuffle many people. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And the other thing that if you take your CPP while you're still working and you're earning 
a fairly high salary, then you're also paying tax at a fairly high rate on the CPP earnings that right. is on top of your salary now. So it's taxed at your marginal rate there. And so you have to throw that all into the mix. And I'm not saying what decision you should make, but you should know what the numbers are before you make it. Absolutely. We'll get into decision making a little bit, but the before then, it's definitely what you have to think of. And it's it's here's the thing. Even if you're paying a fairly high tax rate on your CPP because you're still working and you have other sources of income, doesn't mean you still don't take it early, right? Those are, it is a yes. consideration. It's a factor, but it's not the overwhelming overriding factor. Whereas things like sure. all the security, which we'll talk about a different episode is, is a different story because of the clawback, right? So if your income is too high, you're not going to get it anyway. So you may as well defer and, and benefit yeah. from that benefit. So that's, that's the benefit stuff. Uh, we talked about the benefit side. Now let's talk about, this is just a retirement benefit. We don't, we kind of zero in on this. We're going to finish this off. Let's talk about what should be your thought process about what goes into determining when you take CPP at 60 or 65 or 70 or any point in between, you know, what are the factors that one should really take into consideration before making that, that decision? Well, I think you mentioned briefly earlier, how long do you expect to live? And, and so if, if you have a good reason to suspect, suspect a shorter than average life expectancy, then you probably should be taking your CPP early. But that's, I think, a fairly small group of people that have a good reason to suspect that a shorter than average life expectancy. Yeah, expectancy. and let me jump in on this to say yeah. people misunderstand the concept of life expectancy all the time. It is not a terminal date. It is an average. And that's a 50% point. So if your life expectancy at 60, for, for a 65-year-old is 20 years, just to pull a number out of, my, out of the air, that does not mean that you're likely to die at 85. It means you're 50% of the people in your group are likely to die before 85. But 50% live well beyond that. In fact, like a large percentage of those. And in addition to that, and this really, this really messes with people's minds, is that every year of life you have, your life expectancy actually increases a little bit because you survived. And now the people who died are not being counted in the, in the data anymore. So it's one of these things where don't just, I've seen it happen. People say, well, you know, life expectancy is X. No one in my family's ever lived beyond Y. Well, that's, that's them. Yeah. Talk about you and, and you can be a very different situation. Now, if you have a, if you got a laundry list of health issues at 60, then odds are, you know. Okay. So that, that's one issue. Uh, do you need the money now? Uh, wh what are your current yes. expenses and what are your current and future incomes? And when do you need the money most? Do you need it now or, or will you need it later? One important consideration, and, and we haven't really talked about, uh, as you said, the other benefits, but there, there's survivor benefits uh, payable under the uh, CPP. And there's a complex formula if you're eligible for both a retirement pension and a survivor's pension. And that can play a big factor in when you should take your own retirement pension. So you should understand the complex calculations for a combined retirement survivor's benefit. And that's actually another interesting, I had a case a while back where someone was on a survivor's benefit, wanted to stop paying for CPP because they were over 65, they were like 67, and they couldn't do that. They had to qualify for their own pension first in order to basically do that. And yeah, it was a bit of a mind bender going through the rules on that one. And I, yeah. man, I actually manually calculated what the additional upside of the contributions were versus that. So it, it's the comp, I will, I will firsthand say it is a complex contribution that if calculation that you should probably seek help on quite yeah. honestly. Yeah. And then there's, there's sometimes other benefits such as the guaranteed income supplement. If you're low income and you're receiving the old age security, you might be eligible for the guaranteed income supplement. And the amount that you receive for that is dependent upon other income that you have. So when you take your CPP could affect, could be affected by whether or not you know you'll be eligible for the guaranteed income supplement. So again, sometimes it's better if you took it earlier, got a smaller rate and you get more GIS as a result. Sometimes it might be better if you didn't take your CPP until age 70 and, and get five years of higher GIS benefits in the interim. So again, I, I don't think there's a single answer if you're eligible for GIS, but know what you're not. So talk to a financial planner, somebody who knows the ins and outs of those two benefits and how they interact before you make your decision on when to take your CPP. And I always say that at the end of the day, frankly, I want to see this tested. There are way too many variables in terms of how this interacts with, interacts with taxation, 
how this interacts with other benefits. The question comes down to how, again, you could be doing something you think is completely benevolent, just I'm applying for my pension. And you could end up in a less than optimal situation because your timing did not take into consideration other factors. So you already mentioned, so you already mentioned life expectancy. You mentioned basically capacity, right? If you can't, if you can't support yourself and you need the money, then mm. well, all the optimization calculations go out the bloody window, quite honestly. Right. So there's that. And then in addition to that, what any other consider, I mean, you said how that interplays with other benefits, anything else we should be considering? Yeah. Do you have uh, children or do you want to leave a, an estate for anybody? And, and is that a factor or not? Because again, if, if that's not a concern for you, then you may want to uh, spend some of your other, if you've got RRSP savings, you may want to spend those first to defer your CPP, get a larger, fully indexed uh, CPP, spend some of your RRSP monies because you're not worried. Whereas if, if you want to keep a, a large estate, then maybe you take your CPP earlier, keep your RRSP uh, dollars uh, savings and, and because they will form the majority of your estate. And again, I'm not a financial planner, so I don't get uh-huh. into the details of that with any of my clients. But it's it's a factor you you should think about. Agreed. I would say that it's a little bit overplayed in that I will say that a couple of years of CPP probably isn't going to make a difference for most. I also say that if you really want to make sure it's an estate, insurance is the best way to do it typically. And sometimes that point is, is there's lots of this considerations. Okay. So we've gone over this consideration, largely we've gone over the considerations. Let's talk about the other benefits beyond just retirement that CPP brings to the table because it's a far more robust program than yeah. you get from any other, like any employment pension. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, so the CPP retirement pension, as we say, started at 65 or as early as 60. Prior to that, if you became disabled while you were working, there is a disability benefits uh, under CPP. You have to be incapable regularly of performing any substantial gainful occupation. That's the definition of disability for CPP purposes. So you you can't just be, oh, I can only work four days a week instead of five days a week. That's not going to qualify for a CPP disability. So you have to be fairly disabled. But if you are, two things happen. You you get a pension and it's, it's more than the retirement pension. The calculation is 75% of what you would receive as a retirement pension, plus a flat rate benefit that currently is a little over $500. So it works out to about $200 more than what the retirement pension would be generally. Plus, if you've got any children under age 18 or between 18 and 25 attending school or university, they could be eligible for some benefits as well. And then the other thing that does, if you're disabled and receiving a CPP disability pension, that period of time is excluded from your contributory period so that ultimately, whenever you receive a retirement pension, those years of low or zero earnings while you're disabled get dropped out of your contributory period to make your retirement pension a higher calculation than if you're not working and you don't receive the CPP disability. And then the other benefits payable are survivor's benefits if and when you die whether you were receiving the retirement pension or if you died at a young age. There are uh, monthly survivor. There, first of all, there's a lump sum benefit payable for $2,500 to assist with funeral expenses. That's not a big factor, but it, it can help a little bit with funeral expenses. And then there's a monthly pension, again, to, if you've got a surviving spouse or if you've got children uh, same restrictions under age 18 or between 18 and 25, there is monthly benefits payable to them. Yeah. So, I mean, disability, survivor benefits, uh, orphans benefits, I mean, these are things that are just not commonplace elsewhere. Again, I will make, I'll reiterate your point on disability. This is definitely not someone's first form of disability covered or only in most cases because it is, you know, severe and prolonged, which basically means there's no chance you going back to work. If you're going to be, you know, disabled for for a year and a half because you got some sort of a condition, you're probably not going to see a penny out of Canada pension plan. So don't count on that. Okay, so excellent. Uh, oh, I mean, all in all, it's I'd say it's a pretty it's a pretty good national program. I think we've you know we've stood up pretty good compared to other countries. Now let's talk about we're going to come back to uh, to the kind of core of this bit of this podcast, which is 
business owners. So let's talk about what the difference for Canada Pension Plan with business owners is mm-hmm. versus being an employee. And I'll let you, I'll let you tackle that. And I'm going to go into some other questions. Sure. So the main difference, and I think you mentioned earlier, is is that you're paying both sides of the contribution cost. So it the only time in my mind where that's a real factor. If you're a small business owner, you're self-employed, it's it's not that you have the choice anyway. If you mm-hmm. have net earnings from self-employment, you must pay contributions on that money. The type of individual that has the choice is if you've got your own corporation and you have the choice to pay yourself a salary or pay yourself dividends, then if you pay yourself a salary, you're paying the CPP contributions both as the employer and as the employee. So you're paying both halves of it out of the company somehow. But if you pay yourself dividends, you don't pay CPP contributions and you don't have a pension at the end of it. Or if you had paid in for some years as an employee before you incorporated and and, uh, began to have this choice, then your pension would be smaller because of the the years that you pay yourself dividend counting as zeros for your uh, average earnings. So a couple of things we hit upon there. So yes, it's the optionality between dividends or, or income and how you don't pay CDP to pay dividends. Now, I have, unfortunately, many accounts or bookkeepers have passed this off as tax savings. It's not tax savings. You're giving up a benefit. And when I've sat down with many, many employers who believe they were paying less tax because they're picking dividends, and I explained to them how integration worked, and really the only real savings of note were Canada Pension Plan and that their pension would be smaller, they were displeased. Uh, the vast majority of them opted to keep Canada Pension Plan. And I know some people have gone around saying, well, if you look at you know the fact, if you look at double the cost that gets paid, you know the ROI is not great. And my response is always like, again, it's it's a it's a guaranteed index pension for life with all these extra benefits. You're, you can't compare it to an investment portfolio one for one. And then the last point to be made here is, and I said this at the beginning, the entire employer pays X and employee pays Y is nothing more than a mental accounting trick. The employer pays the employee 100% of the money. Okay. Whether if it's a hundred, let's just use a round number. If I pay them a hundred thousand and I got to pay, was it $3,000 for CPP on top of that? I'm paying them 103,000. As an employer, I care about total costs of my employee. I don't care just about their salary. So guess what? If it's the exact same thing, if CPP Turner can or pension plan were around today and said, "Well, no, 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 employer is going to pay 100 percent of it now," do you think everybody would get a three thousand dollar? You know, do you think they would get a, a three thousand dollar reduction on their income? Quite possibly, or they would just not get another salary increase until they got three thousand dollars of of total cost growth, right? So it's it's just a trick, right? The employer pays 100 percent of it, full stop, right? Whether we're just we're just arguing about what we're calling it in the end, yeah. So that's the the business owner stuff is pretty straightforward. Now, I think it does complicate matters when we talk about when to start taking Canada Pension Plan, because now successful business owners typically also have, you know, they may have holdings and investments in their in their corporation. That skews the calculation on when, you know, when is the optimal time to take it, right? So lots to consider there. So we've, we've really gotten, I think, a pretty in-depth conversation of how this works, uh, Doug, and I, I thank you for it. Is there anything else about pensions or about Canada Pension Plan in particular that you think we didn't cover that people should know about. I'm looking over my notes here. I don't, I, I think we've covered all the points I had. So uh, I, I can't think of anything else that we I, haven't I'm talked about. So, so that is, I'll, I'll take that as an endorsement that we did a good job of covering everything coming from you. Yeah. So uh, Doug, thank you so much for taking the time today. I greatly appreciate it. And I hope uh, everybody enjoys uh, talking to one of, the, one of the biggest experts in the space on this and covering off all the bases. Great. Thanks for that, Jason. And thanks for inviting me. My pleasure. And final note, where can people find you? Online, DR Pensions uh, Consulting. That's the best uh, way to get a hold of me. Email drpensions at shaw.ca. Excellent. And that was today's episode of Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners with uh, Doug Runchy on CPP. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you learned a little bit about, a little bit more or a lot more about Canada Pension Plan, how it does benefit you, how it is beneficial, how it's not going bankrupt, how it works, and how, especially when it comes time to claim, there's a, or start receiving benefits, there's a lot to think about. As always, if you enjoy this podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever is it your podcast. And until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals, business owners, and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com.
You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca. You can even ask Surrey, Alexa, or Google Home to subscribe for you.